I've realized a couple of times lately where my shirt color ends up accidentally coordinating with the color of one of the album covers. And it also notoriously beat out Pink Floyd's The Wall to win Album of the Year at the 1981 Grammys. It's just, it's not usually intentional, it's total coincidence, but it's kind of weird, huh? one and all, and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Yes, it's Backtracks time again already. February. I mean, it's, it's the middle of February, for cripes sakes. What the heck's going on? But anyway, I whine enough about the passage of time, so let's just get down to it. Yes, Backtracks, for those of you who might not know, is my monthly rundown of noteworthy album anniversaries, divisible by five, with at least one Spotlight album review. So, without wasting any more time, let's just jump right on in and see which albums are celebrating anniversaries for the month of February 2020. 65 years ago this month, the Dave Brubeck Quartet released Brubeck Time. Produced by George Avakian, this album featured one of Brubeck's earlier lineups with Paul Desmond on sax and Joe Dodge on drums. It was also a rare studio recording released during a period when nearly all of Brubeck's albums were live. Along with two new compositions, Audrey and Stompin' for Millie, this album includes standards such as Brother Can You Spare a Dime, Pennies from Heaven, and Jeepers Creepers. February of 1955 also saw the release of Tony Bennett's very first studio album, Cloud 7. Produced by Mitch Miller, it featured a small jazz combo as opposed to the big band sound Bennett would become famous for working with. This set of great American songbook standards includes Give Me the Simple Life, the Jimmy Van Heusen song Darn That Dream, and the Jimmy McHugh Clarence Gaskell tune I Can't Believe That You're In Love With Me. Six decades ago this month, Nigerian percussionist Babatunde Olatunji released his album Drums of Passion. Widely credited as the first album to popularize African music in the Western Hemisphere, it went on to sell an estimated 5 million copies. The single Jingoloba became Olatunji's signature song and has been covered over the years by Serge Gainsbourg, under a different title and with no credit to Olatunji, by Santana as the track Jingo on their debut album, and even by Fatboy Slim. Also released in February of 1960 was the Kenny Dorham album, Quiet Kenny. Featuring Tommy Flanagan on piano, Paul Chambers on bass, and Art Taylor on drums, the album features Dorham's own compositions, Lotus Blossom and Blue Spring Shuffle, as well as I Had the Craziest Dream by Matt Gordon and Harry Warren, and Alone Together by Howard Dietz and Arthur Schwartz. Dorham previously played alongside, among others, Dizzy Gillespie, Charlie Parker, and Thelonious Monk. February of 1965 saw the release of Herman's Hermits' self-titled debut album, also known as Introducing Herman's Hermits. During its 40-week run on the Billboard 200, the album peaked at number two on the chart. It was propelled by the success of perhaps the Hermits' most popular hit single, I'm Into Something Good, which was a top 20 hit on the Billboard singles chart. The album also includes covers of Sea Cruise and Mother-in-Law, as well as another popular single, Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter, which oddly was released as a single only after two other singles which would later appear on the band's second U.S. album. Also celebrating its 55th anniversary this month is The Impressions' fourth album, People Get Ready. This album by the Curtis Mayfield-led vocal group topped the Billboard R&B albums chart and reached number 23 on the Billboard 200. The title track was the group's biggest hit, reaching number 14 on the Billboard Pop Singles chart and number 3 on the R&B Singles chart, and it became a defining song of the civil rights movement. It's ranked as one of the greatest songs of all time by Rolling Stone and Mojo Magazine, and was inducted into the Grammy Hall of Fame. Also, it was covered by numerous artists, including Bob Marley, Bob Dylan, Jeff Beck, and Rod Stewart, and it was sampled by Macklemore and Ryan Lewis for their hit single, Same Love. Half a century ago this month, James Taylor released his sophomore album, Sweet Baby James. It was the breakout success that Taylor sorely needed at the time, as reportedly he had no place of his own to live while recording. He would stay at the home of producer Peter Asher or guitarist Danny Korchmar. The album peaked at number three on the Billboard Albums chart and is certified triple platinum. It peaked at number six in the UK. The single Country Road reached the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100, but Fire and Rain was a chart hit, peaking in the top five. The album received a Grammy nomination for Album of the Year, and Rolling Stone ranked it at number 104 on a list of the greatest albums of all time. Also turning 50 years old this month is Black Sabbath's self-titled debut album. Released in the UK quite appropriately on Friday the 13th of February 1970, it was recorded in one day, live in the studio with virtually no overdubs. Widely considered to be the first heavy metal album, it peaked at number 8 and earned gold certification in the UK. It was released in the US four months later, where it peaked at number 23 on the album chart and eventually went platinum. Various music authorities, including Rolling Stone and Kerrang!, rank it among the 50 greatest metal albums of all time. 
February of 1975 saw the release of Grover Washington Jr.'s fourth album, Mr. Magic. It reached the top ten of the Billboard Pop Albums chart and hit number one on both the Billboard Soul and Jazz Albums charts. Produced by Creed Taylor, the album features future jazz group Four Plays, founding members Bob James on keyboards and Harvey Mason on drums, as well as Phil Upchurch on bass. The title track was a top 20 hit on the Billboard R&B singles chart, and the album also features the Billy Strainhorn composition, Passion Flower. Also released 45 years ago this month was Physical Graffiti, the sixth album by Led Zeppelin. It topped the album's charts in the US, the UK, and Canada, and was a top 10 album in six other countries including Australia, France, and Spain. It was the first album to go platinum on pre-orders alone, and upon its release, all five of the band's previous albums re-entered the Billboard 200 chart. Trampled Underfoot was the only single released from the album, which peaked at number 38 on the Billboard singles chart. It also includes the fan favorite, Cashmere. The album is ranked among the 100 greatest albums of ever made by Rolling Stone, Mojo, and Q magazines, and is included in Robert Dimry's book, 1001 Albums You Must Hear Before You Die. Happy 40th anniversary this month to Hearts' fifth album, Baby Lestrange. Their first album without the Fisher Brothers, Michael and founding member Roger. The album went gold and spent 22 weeks on the Billboard 200 chart, peaking at number 5. It was a top 40 album in Canada. Lead-off single, Even It Up, was a top 40 single on the Billboard Hot 100 and featured brass backup by the Tower of Power horn section. The title track was released as a follow-up single, but was the first single from the band to fall short of charting on the Billboard Hot 100, reaching number 9 on the Bubbling Under chart. February of 1980 also saw the release of Mad Love, Linda Ronstadt's 10th album. It was the first album by a female solo artist to debut as high as number 5 on the Billboard Albums chart, and was her 7th consecutive album to sell over 1 million copies. Its first two singles, How Do I Make You and Hurt So Bad, were top 10 hits on the Billboard Hot 100, and both went top 20 in Canada. I Can't Let Go was a top 40 single. How Do I Make You earned Ronstadt a Grammy Award for Best Female Rock Vocal Performance. The album features covers of three Elvis Costello songs and the Neil Young song, Look Out For My Love. In February of 1985, Whitney Houston released her self-titled debut album. It took a little over a year to reach the number one spot on the Billboard 200, but once it did, it spent 14 weeks there. It also was a number one album in Australia, Canada, Norway, South Africa, and Sweden, and a top ten album in at least seven other countries. It was the first debut album and the first album by a solo female artist to produce three number one Billboard Hot 100 singles, Saving All My Love For You, How Will I Know, and The Greatest Love Of All, which I actually didn't find out until I was doing the research for this video, is a cover of a George Benson song. The album was nominated for four Grammy Awards, including Album of the Year, Saving All My Love For You won the Grammy for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance, and Greatest Love Of All was nominated for Record of the Year. Also released 35 years ago this month was Tears for Fear's sophomore album Songs from the Big Chair. It topped the album's charts in the US, the Netherlands, Germany, and Canada, and was a top 10 album in the UK, New Zealand, Australia, and Switzerland. The group's best-selling album, it produced two number one singles in the US, Canada, and New Zealand, Shout and Everybody Wants to Rule the World. In both Australia and the Netherlands, Shout and Everybody Wants to Rule the World hit number one and number two respectively. Both singles were top five hits in the UK and Ireland. Follow-up single, Head Over Heels, which is my personal favorite off the album, went top 10 in the US, Canada, and Ireland, and top 20 in the UK, New Zealand, and Belgium. Three decades ago this month, MC Hammer released his third album, Please Hammer, Don't Hurt Him. Despite criticism over lightweight lyrical content and lawsuits over sampling of classic songs, the album spent 21 weeks at the top of the Billboard 200 and 28 weeks at the top of the Billboard Hip Hop and R&B Albums chart, and it was the first hip hop album to be certified diamond by the RIAA. You Can't Touch This was the album's first single and Hammer's most successful hit. It topped the singles charts in seven countries and was a top ten hit in ten others. Have You Seen Her and Pray were top five hits in the US, New Zealand, the UK, and the Netherlands. The album topped the chart in Canada where it won the 1991 Juno Award for International Album of the Year, and it also reached number one in Zimbabwe. Also released in February of 1990 was Eric Johnson's third album, A Via Musicum. In its 60-week run on the Billboard 200, it reached a peak position of number 67. Cliffs of Dover, which would become Johnson's signature song, was one of three singles from the album to reach the top 10 of the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. It peaked at number 5 and won a Grammy for Best Rock Instrumental Performance. Righteous and Trademark also hit the Mainstream Rock Top 10. Johnson pays tribute to fellow guitarists Wes Montgomery on the track East West and Steve Hennig on the song Steve's Boogie. And by the way, thank you to my friend Jeff for introducing me to this album just a few months back. It's a great album. I really enjoy it. Thanks, Jeff. 
a quarter of a century ago, Better Than Ezra released their major label debut album, Deluxe. Even though it only reached number 35 on the Billboard 200 and number 3 on the Billboard Heat Seekers chart, it achieved platinum certification nine months after release. Its most successful single was the Hot 100 Top 40 hit, Good, which topped the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart. Follow-up single, In the Blood, hit number 4 on the Modern Rock Tracks chart. Both singles went top 5 on the Canadian Rock Songs chart. By the way, this is an amazing album, one of my favorite albums from the 90s. If you haven't checked it out yet, you gotta check it out. Also released in February of 1995 was Shania Twain's sophomore album The Woman in Me. Produced by her then-husband Mutt Lang, the album topped the country charts in the US, Canada, and the UK, and peaked at number 5, number 6, and number 7 respectively on the same country's primary albums charts. It had sold 4 million copies by the end of the year, and by December of 2000 had sold 12 million. Of the eight singles released from the album, all but two topped the Canadian country singles chart, and four reached the top of the US country singles chart. Any Man of Mine, If You're Not In It For Love, I'm Outta Here, You In My Love, and No One Needs To Know. Any Man of Mine and the leadoff single, Whose Bed Have Your Boots Been Under, reached the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100. Happy 20th anniversary this month to Three Doors Down's debut album, The Better Life. It peaked at number 7 on the Billboard 200 and number 6 on the Canadian Albums Chart. Their best-selling album, it's been certified six times platinum by the RIAA. The first single, Kryptonite, reached number 3 on the Billboard Hot 100, was a top 10 hit in Australia and Canada, and a top 20 single in the Netherlands and New Zealand. Kryptonite, Loser, and Duck and Run all topped the Billboard Mainstream Rock Tracks chart. The final single from the album, Be Like That, was a top 40 hit on the Billboard Hot 100. February of 2000 also saw the release of Together. This soundtrack from the MTV original movie also served as the debut self-titled album by the fictional boy band, played by actor-singers including Evan Farmer, who's since become a home renovation TV show host, and Kevin Farley, brother of the late comedian actor Chris Farley. It reached number 35 on the Billboard 200 and produced the singles You Plus Me Equals Us, Calculus, Before We Say Goodbye, and Say It, Don't Spray It, none of which charted. The movie spawned a TV series and a second album released later in the year. Okay, not only is this album full of hooky and catchy and funny songs, but the movie is a great satire of the boy band phenomenon, which was in full gear at the time. And uh, I, I happen to have the DVD, but it's pretty darn hard to come by. But if you can find a way to watch this movie, watch it. It's just hilarious. And I mean, the album's not bad either. In February of 2005, Ben Lee released his fifth album, Awake is the New Sleep. Produced by Brad Wood, whose credits include Pete Yorn, Liz Fair, and Say Anything, it peaked at number 5 on the Australian Albums Chart and holds a double platinum certification there. Four singles were released from the album. Gamble Everything for Love and Catch My Disease were top 40 hits on the Australian Singles Chart, with Into the Dark and We're All in This Together charting in the top 100. Catch My Disease won three ARIA awards, the Australian Grammys, including Single of the Year and Song of the Year, and gained exposure in the U.S. by being featured on TV shows including Grey's Anatomy and Scrubs. The album won three ARIA awards including Best Male Artist and Best Independent Release, and was nominated for three more including Album of the Year. Also released 15 years ago this month was O, oh, the debut album by Omarion, former member of the R&B boy band B2K. It peaked at the top of the Billboard 200 and Billboard R&B albums charts, and within two months had achieved gold certification. The title track was a top 20 hit on the New Zealand singles chart and the Billboard R&B singles chart, and went top 40 on the Billboard Hot 100. Follow-up singles, Touch, written by Pharrell Williams and produced by the Neptunes, and I'm Trina, also charted on the R&B singles charts, with Touch peaking in the top 40. The album received a Grammy nomination for Best Contemporary R&B Album. Happy 10th anniversary this month to Marina and the Diamonds' debut album, Family Jewels. It peaked at number 5 on the UK Albums Chart, number 6 in Scotland, number 9 in Ireland, and number 2 on the Billboard Heat Seekers Chart. After early singles received social media buzz from the likes of Perez Hilton and Kanye West, the single Hollywood reached number 12 on the UK Singles Chart and was also a top 20 single in Austria and Germany. Subsequent singles, I Am Not a Robot and Oh No, went top 40 in the UK, with I Am Not a Robot peaking at number 6 in Norway. Also released in February of 2010 was Lil Wayne's seventh album, The Rebirth. Also his seventh consecutive top 10 Billboard 200 album, it debuted at number 2 on that chart, and held a number 1 spot on the Billboard Top Rap Albums chart for 6 weeks, and by the end of March it had gone gold in the US. It peaked at number 5 in Canada, number 15 in Switzerland, and number 24 in the UK.
Lead single Prom Queen featuring Chanel peaked at number 15 on the Billboard Hot 100. Drop the World featuring Eminem also reached the Hot 100's top 20 and was the most successful single internationally, reaching number 24 in Canada, number 43 in Ireland, and number 51 in the UK. Other singles include Hot Revolver featuring Dre and Knockout featuring Nicki Minaj. In February of 2015, Imagine Dragons released their sophomore album Smoke and Mirrors. It debuted at the top of the album's charts in the US, Canada, and the UK, and was a top 10 album in over a dozen countries including number 2 in Spain, number 3 in Germany, number 4 in Australia, and number 5 in Mexico. Lead-off single I Bet My Life was the album's most successful, making the top 40 of the Billboard Hot 100 and the Australian, New Zealand, Canadian, and UK singles charts. Follow-up singles Gold and Shots, along with I Bet My Life, all reached the top 20 of the Billboard Rock Songs chart. The album currently enjoys platinum certification in the US and Canada, and gold in at least eight other countries including the UK, Brazil, and Norway. Five years ago this month also saw the release of Diana Krall's 12th album Wallflower. Produced by David Foster, it was her sixth album to peak inside the top 10 of the Billboard 200. It reached number two in Canada, number four in France, number seven in the Netherlands, and number 19 in the UK and it topped the Canadian and U.S. jazz albums charts. In contrast to her previous albums, which mostly cover great American songbook standards, this album showcased interpretations of pop and rock hits from the 60s through the 80s, such as The Eagles' Desperado, Elton John's Sorry Seems to be the Hardest Word, Crowded House's Don't Dream It's Over, and The Mamas and the Papas' California Dreamin'. Fellow Canadians Michael Bublé and Brian Adams are featured guest vocalists on the album. And once again, we have arrived at the Spotlight Album of the Month. And yes, unfortunately, despite the fact that I was soft promising you last month that uh, from now forward I was going to have two Spotlight Albums per month at least, yes, it's only just one my album this month again. Uh, sorry about that, folks, but uh, hopefully from March going forward I will have at least two each month. Uh, I'm going to do my do my best. Uh, the limitation this month was money. Uh, for And also, well... Another part of it was I really had trouble finding any albums that I really uh, had any desire to listen to. I, I wanted to get uh, Physical Graffiti by Led Zeppelin, even though last year I did a Led Zeppelin album as a spotlight, uh, but I wasn't, I wasn't able to find that one. And uh, this one I was only able to find new. I wasn't able to find a used copy of it. But there's an interesting twist on the spotlight album this month. Instead of an old classic album, it is actually a very new album. Uh, it was released a meager five years ago this, uh, this month. And so I just thought I'd, thought I'd you know, give it a little bit of a twist. And again, kind of like I was talking about with uh, G-Love in my recent Now and Then video, this is another artist that I'd kind of been looking for an excuse to uh, delve into a little bit. Uh, and this gave me my excuse, uh, seeing that this album was celebrating its five-year anniversary this month. It is I Love You, Honey Bear by Father John Misty, his sophomore album, at least under that moniker. Uh, yes, it was released in February of 2015, five years ago this month. And... Uh, uh, it's it's a very interesting album. I uh, I've obviously with um, oh his next album I can't remember uh, pure comedy. I'd seen nothing but rave reviews of that album, and I still have not yet listened to it. Uh, so I you know as I said I've kind of been looking for an excuse to check out Father John Missy's stuff, and I was pleasantly surprised with this album. Uh, it's uh, very nice. Um, the one thing which is kind of a, a nitpick with how they set up this album physically. It's a double LP, and it's uh, it plays at 45 RPMs. So when I first put it on, I was kind of freaked out by the sound, but uh, then I realized it was a 45 RPM album, so it sounded much better when I switched the uh, speed of my turntable. But uh, yeah, so I mean, in that way, in that respect, you know, yes, a very minor quibble. It's kind of a pain to have to flip the record over, th you know, three times instead of just once. But hey, the songs are worth it. Honestly, it's it's, it's a very interesting album. I love the sonic palette. The, the instrumental palette of this album is just great sonic textures, really lush. Uh, it kind of reminds me of 60s stuff, you know, like maybe some Laurel Canyon stuff from the 60s. Just great, great instrumentation. And But the lyrics, on the other hand, are kind of uh, wry and self-deprecating and very, uh, very, very biting sense of humor uh, Father John Misty has on his stuff. And uh, I honestly have trouble picking out favorite songs on here. I'm, I've, I've only listened to this album once, I will grant that, so, uh, and maybe after repeated listens I will uh, be able to actually note favorites. Uh, but yeah, oh, oh, Bored in the USA was actually a uh, one that really caught my ear. And also the uh, the first track, I Love You Honey Bear, the, the title track, although that was probably just because it was the first track that I heard, so it kind of 
in some ways the leadoff track on an album is going to be an ear grabber you know in some respects but anyway yeah a very very good album i honestly don't have a whole lot more to say about it uh until maybe until i give repeated listens to it as i said uh perhaps you guys would like to see a more in-depth review later on uh with this uh, let me know in the comments uh or 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 if you recommend another father john misty album over this one let me know i i have a feeling that the uh the majority opinion on that is going to be pure comedy and uh with my experience with this album i um am Legit legitimizing in my head the an excuse to pick up uh, pure comedy because uh, I've heard that it's a great album. It's, it was on a lot, a lot of people's year-end lists and sorry my voice is dying. That's the one thing about doing these Backtracks videos is they take so long to film that my, my voice just it kills my voice. So I'm gonna wrap it up here but yeah a very very good album. Uh, a good listening experience uh, in my first time out with Father John Misty. Uh, I, re I recommend this and uh, if you've never listened to Father John Misty before, check out I Love You, Honey Bear. Very good album. So, uh, yeah. And so, yes, before my voice dies out completely and totally, I'm going to wrap things up here. I hope you enjoyed Backtracks for February of 2020. And that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Suggestions, questions, constructive criticisms, lay them on me in the comment section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the link to my Twitter feed and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.